today's webinar is What's the Buzz? Supporting and Monitoring Pollinators in New Mexico Habitats and Gardens. Um, these three organizations have come together today um, to really raise the awareness about pollinators and pollinator habitats. Um, we want to share volunteer opportunities and give you ideas and tips to be able to use in your own gardens. Um, my name is Christina Salvador. I'm the Collections Manager at Santa Fe Botanical Garden. Uh, today, I'm also joined by Caitlin Haas, the Southwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist for the Xerces Society. Um, and then following Caitlin, we will hear from Anna Walker. She is the Species Survival Officer for Invertebrate Pollinators at New Mexico Biopark Society in Albuquerque. So we um, hope that you enjoy and learn. So uh, briefly, I wanted to begin with an overview of Santa Fe Botanical Garden and some of the habitats that we steward. Um, we have two locations and I wanna start with our nature preserve, the Leonor Curtin Wetland Preserve is a 35 acre um, site in La Cienega, New Mexico. And it is protected acres surrounding a Cienega, which is a spring fed marsh. And that habitat is abundant with diversity and there's also a um, transitional zone that goes up from the riparian area in a dry upland. Um, this site is open from May through October and we welcome the public for free. Um, but every week when we're closed, even throughout the winter, we have volunteers who go there and continue um, important work. Um, they continue documenting over 300 species of plants, many species of birds and insects. And um, what they do is they contribute these observations and photos and data to citizen science projects. And these are very important um, places where you can upload your, database, your data to a larger national database and projects and help researchers around the country and world um, monitor things, such as the Monarch Butterfly. Um, this is one of the projects that we have down at the nature preserve. And um, you can see here a photo there of it on one of our um, milkweed plants there. And we, we use iNaturalist a lot, which is an app that you can carry on your phone and um, take pictures and document all what you see around you, around your home. And so I encourage you to visit our project at the nature preserve, um, which shows you many, many diverse things that we have there. Um, our other location is closer to town in Santa Fe. It's up on Museum Hill. And this opened in 2013. It's five cultivated acres. Um, it has a much larger footprint of land that we do not cultivate and irrigate. Um, we have included at this site also about 300 species. And it's really a diverse collection of native and non-native species. Um, we tend to you know, provide species of plants that have bloom periods throughout the year. So from early spring until late fall, we wanna make sure that there's plenty of resources for pollinators. Um, we plant them in ways um, to encourage more like a nature-like feeling um, in certain areas. Um, we uh, remain organic um, methods and try to be pesticide free so that we don't harm the pollinators that visit this area. Um, Earlier this year, uh, Caitlin was um, helpful in providing a pollinator plant list through the Xerces Society. And so I had a chance to look at some of the plants that you see on this list. Um, there's forbs on the left and there's um, different shrubs and trees on the right. And uh, I saw what we had growing in the botanical garden. And um, I was really pleased to see this, that we have, have a lot of the plants that are also on this list. And so um, now I'm showing you a map overhead of our garden. And what we do in the garden is we, um, we, we map all the locations of all these different species. And when we look at these um, locations of these pollinator plants, what I really wanna point out is that some areas of the garden, it might be a little bit sparse where there's only a few different species of pollinator plants. But then there's other areas such as here, closer to our pavilion location, where we really have quite a few. And these are examples that you can come and visit and see these plants growing. Um, 
And then over here in the Ojos y Manos Eisen Hands Garden, which is our ethnobotanical garden, we have a much more plantings of native species. And so there's a lot, a lot of concentration of plants here. And this is going to be very helpful for pollinators, keeping them throughout the garden and providing a lot of diverse habitat. Um, so let me go ahead and stop the annotation. And, oh, let me clear that. Clear there. Okay, so this is what the garden looks right, like right now in the winter season with the color and characteristic. And one thing I wanna point out is that we also don't, we allow, allow the plants and shrubs to grow very freely and large and provide plenty of habitat for pollinators um, throughout the seasons. And so it's a very beautiful way of like kind of pro providing leaf litter and not cutting everything back so harshly. Um, and as a contrast to that, you might see examples in other places um, where everything is cut back really harshly um, and the ground is kept extremely clean. And that might look attractive to some gardeners, but it's not exactly a practice that um, is as friendly for pollinators. And so it's just one example of how, you know, you can really in your own garden provide um, a friendly habitat for, gar for pollinators. So I just wanna point out one other resource that the garden has, and I mentioned that we map our plants. Um, we have tours offered online that you can visit year round. And in them, we have different themes such as this one with native plants for a healthy landscape. And I'm hoping that we will do a pollinator tour soon. Um, but please, I encourage you to learn more about the plants that grow at our two sites. Um, there's lots of information and locations and photos, and I think you would enjoy them. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to Caitlin um, and she will talk to you more about what the Xerces Society is doing um, and take a closer look at pollinators. So I'll stop mine. Great, thank you, Christina. Um, let me get my screen shared. And yeah, I just want to say it's really great to see all of the habitat work you all have been doing at the Botanical Gardens. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to see it all in bloom next year. Um, but I'll be talking a little bit more about why it's so important to create habitat for pollinators and other invertebrates, which are these little things that run the world and then talk a little bit more about how important insects and invertebrates are to the function of our planet. So just to, um, hold on, there we go. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of invertebrates on our planet, you might think of insects and invertebrates like snails and spiders as very small creatures. But when you put all of them together, they make up some of the biggest groups in the animal kingdom. So uh, of all described animal species, all that have been named and discovered by science, um, about 97% of all of those described animal species on Earth are invertebrates. So things like arthropods, um, different marine invertebrates like corals and uh, um, mollusk and such, they, they make up most of our animal diversity. And then talking about biomass and abundance, um, about 63% of all animal biomass on earth is made up of invertebrates. And this is a really nice illustration of what um, different groups of invertebrates and other animal uh, groups, how much biomass they make up of, of the world. And it's important to note that only a small fraction of our different insect species are pest species. So the majority of insects and other invertebrates you have on, on the planet are not really causing big, big problems for humans. So most of them are really quite beneficial to the function of our planet and provide really important um, ecosystem services. So just considering um, all the different ecosystem services that invertebrates um, play and how numerous invertebrates are, sorry, my uh, 
slides keep moving on me. Um, it may come as no surprise that um, this giant group of animals play really major roles in many ecosystem functions. So for example, they're really important to soil health. They help cycle nutrients and aerate soils, things like worms and ants do that. We have dung beetles rolling nutrients across the landscape. Um, another example is pest control. While just a few insects are considered pests, many insects are also eating those pest insects and offering that free pest control service. So if we can support the lives of those uh, predators of pests, we can help with pest control and reduce our reliance on pesticides. They're also, invertebrates are also a huge um, foundation of the food web. They provide food sources for many other animals, including other insects, but also things like birds, bats, bears, all kinds of different wildlife. And last but not least, they're also helping plants reproduce. So that's um, one thing, one group of invertebrates that are really, really um, popular to support right now and important to support because of their role in helping with pollination. So specifically with pollinators, um, if we look at all of our different flowering plant species, more than 85% of flowering plant species require an animal to move pollen to another flower. So while there are some pollinators that aren't insects like bats and birds, most um, pollinators, um, most animals that are moving pollen are insects like butterflies, bees, moths, but also wasps, beetles, and flies. Bees are definitely one of our most important pollinating species because they um, gather lots of pollen and have pollen all over their hairy bodies. They're just a really efficient pollinator. But um, uh, all of these different insects are critical to pollination for most of our flowering plant species. And when we consider um, how important these insects are to the reproduction of plants. The, that reproduction of plants um, is also important to the production of fruit and seeds, which are a major part of the diet of many other wildlife species like birds and mammals. Uh, those insect pollinators themselves are uh, food for wildlife too. So for example, um, a chickadee to feed their young will feed um, their chicks around 450 caterpillars a day. So there's that's an, an estimated 450. So considering um, many birds feed their offspring insects, and a lot of those insects are caterpillars, which are the um, larvae of butterflies and moths. They're really critical to feeding birds. And then if you create pollinator habitat of native plants, native flowers, you're also helping um, create habitat for many other wildlife. So um, providing uh, pollinator habitat can also help many other wildlife species. And pollinators don't just help feed wildlife, they really help feed us too. So about 35% of crop production relies on insect pollinators worldwide. And one important thing to know is that most of um, our produce foods, our vegetables and fruits rely on pollinators. So pollen, we, we have pollinators to thank for bringing lots of vitamins and minerals to our diets. And also economically, they're a huge um, benefit to helping us produce crops in the US. Now, if you want to help support pollinators, um, you can create pollinator habitat. And there are three main elements to consider when we're thinking of a pollinator's life cycle and what they need. So first off, we have food in the form of floral resources, so flowers. Um, pollinators are drinking nectar or gathering pollen, eating pollen. So um, those flower resources are really important. Um, to have uh, flowers blooming from early in the year all the way into late in the year, that makes sure you um, provide a food source for pollinators that are active at different times of year and 
or active throughout the year. So things like bumblebees are active throughout the year. Um, so you want to have, you don't want to have gaps in flowering time so they don't um, have to, they have a food source all throughout the year. Another thing um, that's important to consider when creating habitat is providing shelter for nesting and overwintering sites. So um, a lot of bees nest in the ground. So having a place, a dirt, bare ground area that's not disturbed, that can really help um, provide a ground nesting bee habitat. And then also places that can provide crevices and some different leaf litter plant material that won't be disturbed throughout the year or over the winter and um, won't, uh, you know, uh, create any issues for an overwintering chrysalis of a butterfly or cocoon of a moth. Um, and then uh, cavities like bee, uh, a lot of bees will nest in cavities. So things like stem nesting bees, um, and having a safe place of shelter that won't be disturbed for those things to overwinter and nest. And then also having a place that's free of pesticides. So a lot of pesticides um, are lethal to bees and butterflies and other insects that are beneficial to your garden. So going the organic route, not using pesticides is one of the um, easiest things you can do to keep uh, your garden safe and a good um, place for pollinator habitat. Also sourcing plants that have not been treated with pesticides is also really critical when you're choosing native plants for your garden. So when we think about creating pollinator habitat, you might wonder, can my yard, can this uh, you know, a really developed urban area I live in support pollinators. And the good news is, is that yes, pollinators are able to use really small patches of habitat or just find little resources in different places across a, a small landscape. So the amount of landscape or the amount of habitat in our landscape can directly influence um, how many insects we have. And Something as simple as converting uh, part of your rock mulch lawn to a native plant flower bed, that can be a huge boost in habitat compared to a place that did not have any habitat before. So um, while rock lawns are you know, considered a good uh, water conservation uh, landscaping choice, um, providing native plants and water-wise plants um, that aren't using up a lot of water, more native natural landscaping is really better than a rock lawn. So um, just considering how urban areas can really provide great habitat and um, many different species, especially generalist, generalist species like bumblebees can be supported um, in our urban areas. So just to give you a nice visual of how an urban area can supply the needs of many pollinators um, with resources distributed across several different properties. This is a nice um, example of where a pollinator could find different resources it needs across um, different properties. So even if you can only plant um, a small area of flowering plants, your vegetable gardens, a uh, herb garden, even just um, potted plants and containers, that is still a great resource for pollinators. And, um, you know, if you can't convert your whole yard, if you can't convert um, all, all of the natural space around you, even providing a small space, is, it's really helpful. And where else can you create habitat? So I mentioned those small spaces like containers, vegetable gardens, herb gardens, even things like a fruit tree in your yard that can provide many, many blooms early in the spring. Just make sure you don't spray it with any insecticides, but also things like roadside medians, um, uh, different um, open spaces, places along trails, parks and schools, it doesn't have to be limited to just your yard. 
You can also look into um, promoting pollinator habitat on public areas like schools, libraries, um, bike trails, all different kinds of opportunities in our urban areas. And I've talked about this one way to support pollinators by creating habitat with native flowers blooming throughout the year, making sure you have a place for nesting and overwintering sites and keeping things free of pesticides. You can do this at home and you can organize at a community level. So just an example, there's um, initiative, an initiative called Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA. Albuquerque is a bee city. So if you wanna get involved in their efforts, I recommend um, checking out their website. There's also efforts in Santa Fe to become a bee city that should probably be happening this year. Um, so you can work to create habitat at the community level or just at your home. And there's also a way to support pollinators through research and participating in community science or also known as citizen science. And Anna is uh, gonna talk a little bit more about how you can get involved in these different projects and why it's so important to collect data on all these different insects and invertebrates. So uh, I'll let Anna take over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, let me share my screen here. And get started. All right. Great. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, as Christina mentioned, my name is Anna Walker, and I work as a species survival officer at the New, at the New Mexico Biopark Society. Um, and now that Caitlin has nicely walked us through uh, the importance of insect pollinators and how we can support them by creating habitat, I'm going to talk about what we know about insect declines and not specifically pollinators, but insects generally. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about how community scientists are helping us better understand what is going on with insect populations. So I'll start by talking about what I do at the Biopark Society. I'm one of three people working in what we call the Species Survival Office. And my team and I spend most of our time assessing the conservation status of target species. I work on um, uh, invertebrates, mostly pollinators, but other insects as well. Um, and then I have colleagues who work to assess medicinal plants and freshwater fishes. Um, so basically what we do is we work in partnership with the Species Survival Commission of the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And the IUCN produces this red list of threatened species which is basically like an inventory of plant, animal, and fungi species that, and it kind of details uh, whether or not each species is threatened. So for each assessment that we write, we compile information like where is the species distributed, how big are its populations, and what threats is it facing. And then we use that information to determine the extent to which a species may be at risk of extinction. Um, sometimes it's not at risk of extinction at all. Um, the red list can then be used to determine things like which species have the greatest need for protection, which are the most threatened basically, um, or what can be done to help relieve the pressures on specific species or groups of species. So it's basically a tool to inform the work of conservation biologists. And again, uh, we're funded through the New Mexico Biopark Society. So if you're a member, or go to any of the annual events that we hold. Thank you very much. This is the kind of work that you are supporting. So let's talk about what the red list tells us about insect declines. Well, unfortunately so far, the red list doesn't tell us a whole lot about insect declines. Um, so far it's mostly focused on vertebrates, um, for example, 100% of birds have been assessed, over 90% of mammals have been assessed, 
um, but less than 1% of insects have made it on uh, the red list so far. And this is a little bit troubling because as we heard from, from Caitlin, um, insects are very important to ecosystems. And without a good understanding of how many of these species are threatened, it is really difficult to feel confident that we're taking the appropriate steps to mitigate biodiversity losses. So let's talk a minute about why there are so few insects on the red list. Well, as Caitlin also mentioned, um, there are more than a million described species of insects. So that's a huge number of species to get through. Um, insects are also relatively difficult to study. They're very small and it often takes experts with years and years of experience to even identify them to species. Um, so in general, we know very little about insects. Um, for example, I just finished a project on North American fireflies and over half of the species that we looked at uh, were data deficient, which basically just means we didn't have enough information to know whether or not they were threatened. So we've got a lot of, um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, it's really expensive. Moral of the story, it's really expensive and time intensive to collect long-term data on insects. And that's really the kind of monitoring that we, that we need to see. And I will mention also around 20% of the insects that have been assessed are considered threatened. And that's a little bit scary if you extrapolate that from the remaining 90,000 species that need to be assessed, we likely have a huge number of insect species that need some attention. So beyond the red list, what do we know about the conservation status of insects? Um, over the last few years, the media has reported quite extensively on the declines of insects, which is great. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard the headlines like insect apocalypse and insect Armageddon. And this sort of avalanche of reports was largely started by this 2017 study, which came out of Germany. Um, this was a long-term study conducted at nature reserves throughout the country. And from 1989 to 2016, they found a 76% reduction in flying insect biomass. And that was an average across all of their sites. And again, this is in nature reserves. Um, and National Geographic ran an article on insect declines uh, at some point, and this was the graphic that they used to sort of illustrate what that sort of decline looks like. And, and as you can see, it's quite dramatic and pretty terrifying. Um, so there have been a number of similar studies that have reported similar findings. And this is a map from a 2019 paper, which basically reviewed all of the reports of insect declines from around the world and summarize what we know about declines. So as you can see, uh, much of what we know comes out of Europe and the US, and most of the studies have been done on very few insect groups. The yellow bars that you see, the, those represent the Hymenoptera, which are the bees and wasps. And many of these reports are likely on managed bees like honeybees, which are important for agriculture, obviously. Uh, so this may not even indicate what's going on with our wild bee populations. Uh, the purple bars is kind of the next most heavily represented group. And these are our butterflies. And the reason that this is a heavily represented group is largely because butterflies are much easier to study than other insects. They're easier to identify. And there are a lot of um, community science monitoring programs, especially in Europe, which have helped researchers understand what is going on with butterfly populations long-term. And I'll talk more about long-term butterfly monitoring programs in just a minute. The main takeaway from this map, however, uh, is what it tells us about what we don't know about declines. Um, as I mentioned, there are very few insect groups represented here. Um, and there's very little understanding about what is going on outside of Europe and the US. And this is troubling because uh, most insect diversity resides in the tropics, and we just don't have a clear picture of what's going on in the tropics yet. Um, what's even more troubling is there are some preliminary studies coming out indicating that climate change may be driving declines in the tropics, 
uh, because tropical insects are not adapted to fluctuations in temperature and precipitation patterns like many temperate insects might be. So the question, are we facing a collapse in global insect populations? Maybe um, in many places where we're looking and taking note, we are seeing concerning declines, but we still just don't have the full picture of what is going on globally. So I'll mention briefly some of the main threats to insects. Uh, habitat loss is probably the biggest threat to insects and really all life for that matter, um, at, least in, at least to date. Um, as you can imagine with you know, almost 8 billion people around the world, cities continue to grow and agricultural areas continue to expand uh, and we continue to extract resources. So these are all um, activities that take habitat away from wildlife. Insecticides have a, a, you know, they're designed to kill insects. So they have a direct lethal impact on insects and they're often indiscriminate. So they kill a large number of, of non-target taxa. Uh, herbicides are also, or can be problematic and they have more uh, indirect effects by sort of changing habitats. Uh, for example, they might kill the host plants that herbivorous insects need to survive. Invasive species is another problem. Um, and to kind of illustrate how this can be a problem, in lowland areas of Hawaii, there are a couple of predatory ant species that have been introduced accidentally. And these ants are very successful at attacking and eating native moth larvae, which have no natural defenses against these invaders. Um, and because of this, many native moths in Hawaii are only found at higher elevations now where these predatory ants cannot survive. Light pollution, uh, researchers are starting to, uh, nocturnal insects aren't studied as much as diurnal insects, but researchers are starting to uncover how artificial light at night can interfere with things like bioluminescent mating displays um, in fireflies for example, or um, interfere with migration patterns of insects that use the light of the moon to navigate. Um, also, moths that are attracted to streetlights are often uh, quickly swallowed up, so it can lead to uh, higher predation rates as well. Climate change, of course, is another um, big threat, and unfortunately, we don't yet fully know how many insects are impacted by climate change. Um, so far, researchers have started to document um, things like insects shifting their ranges north or up to higher latitudes uh, to accommodate warming temperatures. And you can imagine that this might be problematic for the species that already live in, in these habitats that are now being invaded. Um, many insects are also hatching earlier in the year due to warmer temperatures, and this can lead to things like host plant mismatch, mismatches. Um, for example, if your host plant is responding to a different cue than temperature, such as day length or precipitation availability, um, that your insect might hatch early and then when it hatches, there's no food source because the plant is still responding to a different cue. So to address insect declines, we really need to start by gathering better baseline data and monitoring insect populations over time. Um, to contribute to this effort, we recently started the New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network. And I'm really excited about this initiative. Um, it's under the umbrella of the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network. So it's one of, I think, almost 32 programs nationwide um, that are using community science volunteers to collect this really wonderful data. Um, the data is collected by a standardized method called a polar block. So trained volunteers walk a set route every few weeks throughout the summer and tally the butterfly species that they see. Um, we ran two routes here in Albuquerque this past year. And then this year in 2021, we'll be running hopefully about 13 routes here in Albuquerque, a couple down in Socorro. 
And we are really hoping to run some routes in Santa Fe as well. So please let me know if you're interested. Um, Caitlin has already offered to help me set up routes in Santa Fe. So I'm going to probably take her up on that offer. Um, and because it's a new program, if you're interested in, in joining, um, you can really help us decide where you want your route to be. So um, is, if there's a nature trail that you hike frequently, we can set up a route there. Um, there's really endless opportunities. If you are interested in getting involved, you can email me, uh, Anna at bioparksociety.org. Um, volunteers are responsible for attending a protocol training in February, so that is next month. So the, the sample season is fast approaching. So if you're interested, let me know soon so we can uh, get started. And then you'll learn to identify butterfly species in your area and survey your assigned route 12 times from March to October. And I just wanna highlight quickly how this data may be used in the future based on what has been done with similar kinds of data collected through other programs. And this is from the Ohio Butterfly Monitoring Program. Uh, trained volunteers contributed um, over 24,000 surveys from 1996 to 2016. And that data revealed that butterfly abundance across all species had declined by 33%, uh, which is pretty drastic. Um, and more than three times as many species were declining than increasing. So again, this, this data that's provided gives uh, conservationists a really great idea about what's going on with insect populations. If you're not interested in butterflies, but you still want to get involved in community science, um, these are all really quick and easy ways to um, interact. Uh, most of them, you basically just take a photo of, of an insect you see or a plant or even a fungi. And um, a lot of these sites will have you create an account. So then you just log in and upload your sighting. Sometimes you supply a little bit of extra metadata um, and you can offer an identification. And it's really cool because experts who are going to be using this data will confirm your identification or identify your species for you. And it's a really fun way to get involved. Um, Christina mentioned iNaturalist earlier, and I do just want to add, if, for example, you upload a photo of a bee and it was taken here in New Mexico, your sighting will end up in the New Mexico Bee Atlas, which is a really great resource for collating all the bee information and helping bee researchers learn about the distributions of different species here in New Mexico. Um, Western Firefly Project. Um, this one is for fireflies, which are not all that common in New Mexico, but they are found here. So please submit your sightings if you see them, because we're trying to figure out exactly where they are. Uh, Bumblebee Watch, as the name suggests, is specifically for bumblebees. iNaturalist is for any life, any flora, any fauna. Uh, Western Monarch uh, milkweed mapper is for monarch um, butterflies or larva or uh, milkweed host plants. And butterflies and moths of North America is for butterflies and moths. If you're looking for other community science opportunities that are a little bit more involved and offer require you to commit to a certain number of volunteer hours, there are also tons of options here. Um, the Great Sunflower Project is um, you basically pick a plant and you watch it and you record the pollinators that visit it. Um, and it's, the idea is that we can identify where pollinators are declining so that habitat can be improved. Um, the Bosque Ecosystem System Monitoring Program is another cool one. It's a partnership between Bosque School here in Albuquerque and the University of New Mexico. And this is a student program where STEM students perform ecological monitoring protocols at, at specific sites within the Bosque. Um, Pond Watch is for migratory dragonflies. Um, these are all really great programs, so I encourage you to check them all out. Caitlin, I don't know if you want to hop on and detail any of these other ones. 
Um, I don't think so. I guess I'll, I'll just mention that um, we'll be sending a resource list with links to all of these different community science projects. And I just highly recommend going to the websites and exploring um, what what all is involved and uh, how to how to get involved. I guess I will say with the Southwest Monarch study, that's a really cool one. And getting data from Southwest Monarchs is really important. Um, we really don't know uh, where monarchs end up that usually are in New Mexico. They can end up with the eastern population that migrates to Mexico. Um, sometimes we get, we, we might, we actually don't know, um, if we have monarchs from the western population that winter on the coast of California. Um, so the um, Southwest Monarch study is all about um, capturing monarchs and tagging them with little marking stickers. And then hopefully we can find out where those monarchs end up and how um, we can improve migration routes and resources for uh, their reproduction. And so, yeah, that's just a really, a really cool one to get involved with. Yeah, and this list is certainly not exhaustive. Um, there are citizen science opportunities for any interest really. So um, this is just a, a starting point if, if you're interested. And that's it. I've, um, we're happy to take questions now and I have put all of our contact information on here. So feel free to reach out to any of us with questions. Thank you, Anna and Caitlin, um, both for your great presentations and a lot of really great information, kind of bright, providing like a broader overview and then like really what's happening right now, um, which isn't always clear because of the lack of data, <laughs> but, um, but it, it was really great. Um, we are available for any questions um, and I did see that, you know, somebody would like resources about choosing plants. Um, I had mentioned that the Xerces Society did do a nice list um, with plants in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. Um, we do have a document that we have put together that will be sent to everyone registered today. Um, and I don't know, if, did we wanna post that here? Yeah, I think we can go ahead and um, post it in the chat. Um, I was also going to say if you would like any um, help choosing plants for a specific site, I am also available for questions. If you have, um, you can look at, at lists that um, other I've I've made. Other um, the Native Plant Society has a great list. Um, the Albuquerque Backyard Refuge has a great list of plants um, for habitat. But if you would like more curated site-specific list, um, I'm happy to help you figure out what would work best for different properties. So shoot me an email if you're interested. We do have a couple of questions now for, uh, in the question, answer, and chat boxes. Um, Tracy Neal asks, do you have a suggestion for activities for grade schools? Uh, so I know um, there are several, you know, community science projects that do have lots of really great resources for educators on their websites. So if you, um, I know Journey North specifically, that's um, a project that mostly tracks migration and changing of season data. So um, I know they have quite a bit of resources on their website for educators. Um, I think community science is just one of those really easy to get involved with, fantastic ways um, for students to do hands-on science. And I think it's perfect for grade schools and that you get to get outside and um, document um, life around you. So uh, yeah, a lot of those community science projects. Um, and then also if, if possible, grade schools can have um, 
school gardens. That's also a great way to get involved and create habitat. So yeah, there's there are a lot of um, options with those different projects. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll say too that iNaturalist is always a great starting point because kids can take, you know, if they have a smartphone or a camera, they can take pictures of anything that they're interested in that doesn't have to be insects. Um, and iNaturalist, when you upload your photos, has a really neat uh, software recognition tool that can suggest an ID for you. And it's not always right, but it's always a great starting place if you want to try and learn what you're looking at. So that's a great one for kids too. Great, thanks. We have another question uh, from Linda Churchill. Do the problems with pesticides and insects include so-called organic pesticides like dorm dormant oil or horticultural soap? Yeah, so organic is definitely preferred um, if you have to use an insecticide. Um, we definitely recommend, um, you know, approaching any pest control with an IPM um, method, which is integrative pest management. So um, really finding the source of what your pest problem is. Um, can you prevent that using preventative methods and um, cultural methods like um, uh, clearing out annual species, but leaving perennial species um, over winter that can um, provide habitat for beneficial insects. There's a whole lot of um, different ways you can uh, try and prevent any pesticide use. So that's, you know, the first step is trying to find a preventative way. Um, and then if you have to use insecticides, yes, going the organic way is better. Um, they can cause some problems. Um, they can sometimes, uh, some of those uh, different soaps can make your plants a little weaker. Um, and they can, and those organic pesticides can uh, influence beneficial insects and pollinators. So just making sure you're applying at a time of day that isn't um, hurting those insects and, you know, just approaching it in a way that's um, you know, preventative first and then taking um, that more uh, invasive action later, if you can. As sort of a follow-up, um, Enid Tidwell asks what the best organic way of dealing with aphids is. And um, Linda Churchill, who uh, gardens at the Botanic Garden, um, we're, we're kind of asking you whether you have a suggestion for that, <laughs> but the other panelists might be able to chime in too. I just spray mine with water. <laughs> and then if, yeah, it gets, can... if it gets really bad, I use soapy water. Um, but I will say I had a really massive aphid problem on one of my roses last spring. And I let it get a little bit out of control just because I was so fascinated by all the um, biocontrol insects that showed up. There were serpids, which are hoverflies buzzing around and they lay their eggs. And once the larva hatches, um, they eat aphids. And the same with lacewings, which are beautiful, delicate little insects that lay eggs on a really cool stalk. So they kind of hover above the leaf. And again, the, the larva hatch and and eat the aphids. So it was kind of a fun science experiment to see what shows up to your aphid infestation. That's great. Yeah. Um, um, I would second the, the water, blasting them with water. And then, um, yeah, just observing other insects eating them is always fun if you can tolerate <laughs> the infestation. <laughs> I was wondering um, what the greatest causes of insect decline are in New Mexico, if anyone knows, or if that's been studied. I, I would say New Mexico, that there are a lot of data gaps for insects in New Mexico, unfortunately. And I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, that's part of the reason I wanted to start the New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network to try and fill in some of those gaps. Um, but based on what's going on in other surrounding states and other parts of the south, Southwest, I would say drought is gonna be hugely problematic um, if it hasn't been already for a lot of insect populations here. But again, we need the research to back that up, but 
that's my suspicion anyway, Caitlin. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, with New Mexico, it's pretty. Um, yeah, just not a not a lot of data to really say um, specifically. But um, yeah, a lot of our uh, climate change issues are are probably going to be um, a big big issue, um, considering that we'll be losing uh, different ecosystems probably at higher elevations. And then um, also for our aquatic invertebrates and aquatic species, you know, having our more permanent water systems turn into more ephemeral and not being able to support a lot of our aquatic invertebrates. So things like dragonflies, mayflies, all the things that feed our fish. Um, those, those are definitely a, a serious threat in the Southwest. Great, thanks. Any other questions from the um, attendees? I think you both covered everything so well that the, the audience is just <laughs> taking it in and has learned so much, so thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing all of this, Christina. It's been yeah, thanks, Christina. This is um, good to bring the botanical gardens in on the on the pollinator, the buzz. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope that uh, we can, you know, be able to provide uh, more, you know, sites and places to do these kind of monitoring. Um, projects and, and definitely extend this to our volunteers. And we hope that everyone watching today can also like share um, more about what they learn and get people involved. Yeah, I'm excited to adopt a butterfly transect with you, Anna. That'll be a lot of fun to do. Yeah, um, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I just um, want to say I briefly covered pollinator habitat, but in our resource list that we're sending out there lots of other webinars and resources for um, building pollinator habitats. So definitely read up on those if you want to um, look into buying native plants and creating habitats. So um, those should be helpful to you. Yeah, this is a great time of year to be thinking about all the gardens that we want to be planting <laughs> when it warms up. Okay, well, I think that's about it. Um, so uh, I think we can conclude the webinar. And if, if I just thank you both for your time and, and thank everyone for joining us. And this is going to be a really helpful resource. So everyone will be receiving um, an email and um, definitely visit all of our different resources that we list there, our websites, and, or get in touch with us. So thank you today, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Sylvan. And um, we will everyone soon. Great. Thank you as well. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.